There's only so many ways to ask a question about Le Chatelier's, but by God, the AAMC is gonna try them all. And realistically, most of the questions on the MCAT don't test hard sciences. If I ask a student what the PKA of glutamate is, they'd probably be able to tell me because that's just a memorization thing. But by the time that the question is wordy and it requires passage information and it's dressed up in a true MCAT fashion, you don't even know if the question's asking about glutamate's PKA. The strategy that I'm about to show you is gonna help with that. You'll be able to get to the nitty gritty of what the question is asking so that theoretically, if you know the science, you'll be able to get every question right. My name's Maggie, I'm a 100 percentile MCAT scorer and a professional tutor, and I'm about to show you how to simplify the question stem. Let's go. So we did have a video on this that I posted a few months ago, but it was really bad quality and I needed to redo it. So you're not crazy if you feel like you've seen a video like this before. Simplifying the question sim is especially helpful to get to the basic science that's being tested by an MCAT question. And most of the time when I ask students to simplify a question stem, if they're a new student, they kind of end up jumbling the words of the question around or, or saying a bunch of synonyms or completely leaving out big chunks of information about the question. This is normal when you first start out with the strategy, but you got to keep practicing. I'm going to show you some questions. I'm going to show you how I would simplify them, and then you can practice simplifying on the same questions yourself. Okay, here's a passage. I'm not going to read it or flowchart it. John actually has a video using the same passage, and he teaches you how to flowchart on it. Um, so I'll link that right here. So if we take this question over here on the right, it says, which type of enzyme catalyzes the conversion of glutamate to GABA? Now, if I asked a student, a new student to simplify this down, they'd probably say, okay, what enzyme changes glutamate to GABA? And if we realized that's pretty much the exact same question and it really doesn't help us at all. Simplifying the question stem is all about getting it down to the basic science so that this is a simple basic science question and it's helpful for us. That's all we want. We want to help ourselves out. So um, how can we simplify this? Well, we know in the passage that we were given these structures for glutamate and for GABA. Um, this passage was also, I think, in my foreshadowing video. So I noticed that while I was going through that there was some foreshadowing going on and this is the question that uh, that is going to be useful for. So I noticed the structures. I noticed that the difference between the structures, besides the little loss of a proton over here on the left side, which is not very important. That could be, you know, differences in pKa's or differences in acidity. Um, not an important finding. What is an, a more important finding is that there is the loss of a carboxylic acid group. So now this question can be simplified down to which type of enzyme takes off a carboxylic acid group? What enzyme removes carboxylic acids? And so that is a simple basic science question and it um, is an easy question to answer. That will be C. You're a terrorist. The next question says, what is the most likely reason why Tuj1 was used to assess the phenotype of cells that have incorporated the five candidate genes? So this one seems a little bit more difficult, a little bit more wordy, but they're totally just beating around the bush to make this question seem more difficult than it actually is. Um, let's kind of get this last part to where it's not so wordy. It says to assess the phenotype of cells that have incorporated the five candidate genes. What type of cells are those? Even throughout the passage, and if you if you watch John's flowcharting video, then you'll see in the passage, they kind of beat around the bush as to what they're doing in this experiment. But it tells you what they're doing is that they're trying to convert fibroblasts into neurons. And why do they use Tuj? Because Tuj1 is a neuron-specific class 3 beta tubulin. So it's only found in neurons. So... The phenotype of the cells that have incorporated the five candidate, candidate genes mentioned down here are neurons. So now we're, our question is, what is the most likely reason why Tuj1 was used to assess neurons? Okay. Even simpler, you could, you could just say, why was Tuj1 used? What does it have to do with neurons? And um, now it's a simple question that was answered kind of like right here 
where it just says they were positive for two one a neuron specific class three beta tubulin. I've even already said it in the explanation of this question. Why was two one used? Because it was neuron specific and they were trying to see if they could convert fibroblasts into neurons. So if they found two one, then they were positive. Their experiment was awesome and they created neurons. So let's find an answer choice that says that. A, Tuj1 induces expression of the tau EGFP protein. So uh, th that's not true. Uh, the tau EGFP was the green fluorescent protein. Um, and the Tuj1 does not induce the expression of that. Tuj1 is expressed in fibroblasts and neurons. So this is, this is a, a, an attractive answer choice because we want it to say Tuj1 is expressed in neurons. That's why it's used. Um, but in this case, they just added the word fibroblast, which makes this totally wrong. Imagine, how could they tell if they've taken their experiment from fibroblast to neurons by measuring TUJ1 if it was expressed in fibroblast and neurons? It's not true. It doesn't make sense. So B's not right. C, TUJ1 is an early marker of neural differentiation. So I don't know if it's an early marker or if it's a late marker, but I do know that it is specific to neurons. So I like that answer choice. It doesn't add any crazy stuff like B did, but it is, um, you know, it makes sense why they would assess, use Tuj1 to assess the phenotype of those. D says Tuj1 is present in embryonic and adult cells in culture. I don't know if that's true, um, but it doesn't, it's, it's not saying what we were trying to say, which is that Tuj1 is specific to neurons. C is saying that, and so it's the right answer. The next question says, of the five candidate genes, which produces a factor that most markedly increases the efficiency with which fibroblasts commit to a neural lineage in vitro? Again, let's break it down. Let's not get overwhelmed with the wordiness of this question. So um, I'll start kind of from the end. I, I see where it says the efficiency with which fibroblasts commit to a neural lineage in vitro. That's what this whole experiment was about, right? We were trying to get fibroblasts to commit to a neural lineage, AKA turn into a neuron. So now the question can be simplified to of the five candidate genes, which produces a factor that most markedly increases the, the efficiency of the experiment. Now let's simplify it down even more. The question saying which produces a factor that most markedly increases the efficiency, which blah, blah, blah. To me, that, that's basically just saying um, of the five candidate genes, which is the most important in this experiment? Which did we find was the most important to committing fibroblasts to a neural lineage? Um, maybe that's not how y'all would simplify it, but that's just what helps me to kind of wrap my brain around this question so that I can actually like look back at the graph and the passage and know what I'm looking for. So I have simplified this down to of the five candidate genes, which is most important in this experiment. So we should have done a little bit of figure interpretation when we were going through the passage, but of course I didn't read the passage right now. So we can kind of go back and look at the figure because that's where we're going to find our answer. Um, this is the five candidate genes down here at the bottom. And it looks like if we read our figure caption, it says that the minus sign indicates omission of the specified gene. So like this one has all of them in there. This is when you subtract the ASCL1. This one's when you subtract the OLIG2. So, um, you can see that, you know, in each of these bars, there's four genes there and one is omitted. So looking at my y-axis, I see that this is the average number of Tuj1 positive cells, which means what? What kind of cell is it if it's Tuj1 positive? It's a neuron, right? So we could even like mark that out and just say that the y-axis is neurons. So we're trying to commit to a neural lineage in vitro. So more neurons means good. That, that means that there was enough gene factors there to commit to a neural lineage. So it looks like when we subtract this ASCL1, we don't have that many neurons. So it sounds like this ASCL1 is going to produce a factor that increases the efficiency of which we create neurons. So that is gonna be our right answer.
I'm going to show you all the next two questions. I'm not going to simplify them. I'm going to give you an opportunity to simplify them. So pause the video and then I'll show you how I simplified them myself. So as you see, there's no formula for simplifying the question stem and some are harder than others. It really does take practice. But if you try to simplify every question that you take from here on out, you'll get better. It'll be faster and easier. And these MCAT questions will stop throwing you for a loop every time you actually understand what the question's trying to ask. So thank you guys for watching. If you want to see me simplify more questions, I try to incorporate all of our strategies in our sample test breakdown. So you can see a lot of that in those videos. As always, let us know what you want to see in the comments, hit like, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.